Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff with Mississippi in the Civil War. I'm back today with episode four of uh, <clears throat> Mississippi, uh, the home front. And uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, what it was like living in Mississippi during the war. Uh, not just for uh, soldiers who were camp actively campaigning, but uh, particularly focused on the civilians who uh, stayed home and uh, uh, manned the farms, uh, produced the, the the foods that kept the uh, Confederate armies in the field, the uh, all of the the people that uh, were impacted so dramatically when war came to Mississippi's doorstep. And I'd like to start this uh, episode with a brief quote from a book, uh, Mississippi and the Confederacy, as seen in retrospect, because I think this this one quote really sums up. The situation that Mississippi found itself in uh, at the outbreak of war in 1861. And this quote goes, In 1861, Mississippi was prepared to fight another Indian war, another war of 1812, or even to take another crack at Mexico. As events soon disclosed, however, this agricultural and rural state simply did not have the wherewithal with which to wage one of the first modern all-out wars. It possessed very little substance of a banking and financial nature, which was also true of the entire Confederacy. Its manufacturing was in an elementary stage, and while its railroads were, within a re were, were in a reasonable good shape, they depreciated rapidly from the inability to replace rails and rolling stock. And th this is, a, I think, a very accurate quote. Mississippi was not prepared in any way, shape, or form to fight the kind of war it found itself in in 1861. This would not be readily apparent, but it would become apparent very soon as the pressures of war put great strains on uh, the state of Mississippi. And it was pressures that uh, this rural agricultural state was ill-equipped to withstand. In the, in the early days of the war, uh, most Mississippians were very optimistic about the outcome of the conflict. Everyone thought it was going to be a short war, it was only going to last a few months, and uh, Mississippians were not uh, ready uh, for a long, drawn-out war of attrition, which is ultimately what they found themselves in. Uh, many of the problems that the citizens of the Magnolia State had to face were problems of simple survival as the war went on. The presence of invading armies and the increasing scarcity of consumer goods, which the local economy could not provide, were going to place a terrible strain on the, the civilian populace. Also, the, the departure of thousands of Mississippi's young men for service in the Confederate armies caused great hardship throughout the state. And uh, tough problems soon cropped up. Uh, provisions had to be made for taking care of the families of indigent soldiers. There were shortages of food, clothing, medicines, salt, uh, and even manpower had to be managed. And uh, Mississippi officials were going to find that there were no easy solutions uh, to these problems. And uh, shown in the uh, illustration here is the Bowman House Hotel. Uh, which was one of the, the finest establishments in Mississippi's capital city uh, prior to the war. Uh, when uh, the Union forces took Jackson in May of 1863, uh, General Grant stayed in the Bowman House Hotel. Uh, it stood at the corner of State and Amit Streets. Uh, in fact, it's right across the street uh, from the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, or the location of it is. Unfortunately, the hotel itself burned in 1863, and there's nothing but a historic marker on the site now to mark its location. And the chief task of the state and local governments during the war and this is, this is what the Bowman House Hotel looked like in 1860, this was about 1867. It had uh, burned and was just a shell that was left. But the chief task of the state and local governments during the war was to maintain the army and supply the wants of the, the destitute. Uh, for the purposes of meeting the increased demands uh, of the treasury caused by the war, the, uh, the Mississippi state tax was increased by 50%. In 1861, a special tax of 3% was levied on all money loaned or, or used to purchase securities. 
And another method of bringing money into the state coffers was by the state issuing uh, $5 million in cotton notes. And this is an example here that I'm showing, uh, a cotton note from 1862. Uh, under the provisions of the act that uh, created these cotton notes, uh, farmers could enter in, into a written agreement with the state to deliver a specific amount of cotton at a certain time and place, uh, such as the governor would designate. In exchange, the owner of the cotton would receive treasury notes to the amount of the value of the cotton uh, pledged at five cents per pound. And uh, these notes were going to uh, become, over time, the chief uh, circulating medium of the state. It's going to be the most common form of money, paper money, you're going to see in the state uh, during the war. In addition to the cotton notes, the state of Mississippi also issued treasury notes. And this is, a, this is an example of a $50 treasury note. These notes were backed by nothing more than the, quote, uh, full faith and credit of the state of Mississippi. Uh, an initial issue of $1 million was made, followed, followed by $2,500,000 more in 1862 and $2 million more in 1864. And, uh, the effect of uh, all of this paper money backed by nothing whatsoever, uh, over time, inflation was going to grow rampant in the state. And the officials of, of the state of Mississippi were never really able to get a good handle on the inflation or uh, bring it under control. And the difficulties in procuring the necessities of life as the war went on was due in large part to the, the depreciation of the currency of, uh, of the state. Uh, by the end of the 1861, both Mississippi uh, money and Confederate money had lost so much value that a soldier's pay uh, for the month would uh, buy him very little. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, at, when the war started, Confederate privates uh, were paid at the rate of $11 per month. And uh, this would not go up until uh, about June of 64, when all enlisted men were uh, uh, had their pay raised by $7 a month. So they were up to $18 a month. But the inflation had grown so much in the meantime that even that uh, that uh, raise uh, uh, didn't mean much because the, the, the purchasing value of the money was just so low. To give you an idea, in December of 1862, Flour was selling in North Mississippi for $50 to $70 a barrel. Salted meat was $0.50 to $0.75 cents per pound. A cheap pair of shoes might cost you $5, while a, while a good quality pair might cost you $15. By September of 1863, um, an ordinary horse would cost you probably about $1,000. A mule might cost you about $700. Uh, shoes were from $75 to $100 per pair, and even watermelons were costing $10, $25 a piece. Uh, about this same time, salt was selling for $45 a bushel. Remember, salt was the only way you could, uh, you could cure your meat. Uh, if you wanted to preserve meat for any amount of time, salt was very important, and uh, people all over the state needed it. And unfortunately, there were no uh, local sources of salt in Mississippi. So shortages uh, were very common during the wartime period. Uh, flour was about $50 per sack, uh, or about $12 per pound, and, uh, and a very rough uh, cotton jeans material for clothing cost about $30 a yard. So you can see a, a Confederate private earning, at the beginning of the war, $11 per month, or even by 1864, $18 a month. That money just wasn't going to buy very much at all. And then the prices were going to go even higher uh, as the war uh, went on and, and particularly as the war began turning against the South. Uh, in February 1864, men's boots were selling for $200 per pair in Natchez and coats were offered at $350 each. The inflation just spiraled totally out of control. But for much of the war, one of the major aims of the state was to try and provide some relief to the destitute families of soldiers, and there were thousands of them in the state. In 1863, $5 million was set aside for this purpose, and a board of five officers was established known as the Indigent Commissioners. Uh, they were uh, indigent, indigent commissioners in uh, every county, and they were to distribute uh, uh, these funds to needy families. 
1864, another $1 million was appropriated for the relief of the indigent. And uh, the uh, commissioners were authorized to impress uh, the surplus produce of all persons who had taken advantage of a Confederate exemption uh, uh, from military service for farmers. And there was just, there was a great deal of suffering as the war went on. The, the women and children who were left to run the farms uh, had to do so under very adverse conditions, making do with uh, very little in the way of uh, of the kind of consumer goods they needed to uh, keep a, a farm functioning properly. And to give you an idea of the kind of pressures that uh, a lot of these civilians were under, I'd like to read a letter written by Mary A. Jones, who was the widow of a Confederate soldier. And she sent a letter to Governor John J. Pettus in April of 1862. And this is what she said. Governor J.J. J. Pettus, in reply to your letter of March 12th, I went up to Yazoo City to see if I could draw anything up there as you directed me. I saw Mr. Mangum, the sheriff of Yazoo. He said I could not draw anything yet as the law did not allow anything for soldiers' widows. As for my husband's position, I can't get that only from the Virginia Law Department. So you see the sad condition I am placed in with three small children to take care of. Half the time we have not bread to eat. Everybody says that I must be taken care of by the Confederate States. They did not tell my dear husband that I should beg from door to door when he went to fight for his country. No, he sacrificed everything he had dear to him on earth for our sake, thinking that he left us in a land of humanity without thought or fear, giving up his life in defense of his country. Kind sir, if you can assist me in anything, I will be very thankful to you. I am your obedient servant, Mary A. Jones. And while the systems would get better as the war went on for uh, aiding in indigent families. Uh, honestly, the state of Mississippi never had the, the means to adequately supply everyone that needed to, to be fed and, uh, and sheltered and uh, clothed. And a lot of Mississippians were going to uh, be in very dire circumstances as, as the war went on because of that. The Confederate Congress did pass a tax in kind in April 1863, and uh, under the provisions of this act, one-tenth of all agricultural products uh, raised in each Confederate state uh, were, were uh, taken by the government. Uh, this tax was dir directly tied to the provisioning of the Confederate Army, and uh, despite the, the fact that it did run into some collection problems, it was for the most part successful. Uh, after its implement implementation, it accounted for about half the total revenue if converted into a com uh, currency equivalent that the, the Confederate government pulled in. So uh, the, every farmer in the state, uh, when they produced their, their crops, they had to give a 10% a, uh, of it to the, uh, to the Confederate government. Uh, so it would be used for uh, the armies in the field. And... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, the a lot of the uh, civilians weren't happy about it, but uh, soldiers came around to collect it, and uh, you had no choice. Uh, you had to uh, had to pay the tax, just just like today. <laughs> and just to give you a little bit of information about Mississippi's wartime governors. Uh, you had uh, two that served during the wartime period. Governor John J. Pettus, uh, who served from 1859 to 1863, and Governor Charles Clark, who served from 1863 to 1865. Um, Clark, in particular, had been a soldier, uh, but was badly wounded at the Battle of Baton Rouge in 1862 and uh, was uh, on crutches for the rest of his life. So he had to retire from the military. He ran for governor in 1863 and, uh, and uh, did uh, win the office. Uh, he was actually northern born. He was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, but he moved to Mississippi in the early 1830s, eventually settling in Bolivar County. Uh, he served in the state legislature as a Whig for six years, then became colonel of the 2nd Mississippi Regiment in the Mexican War. Uh, when the war started, uh, Clark returned to the military, uh, eventually uh, promoted to Brigadier General, uh, wounded at Shiloh, and then wounded again at uh, the Battle of Baton Rouge, uh, on crutches for the remainder of his life, 
Uh, he was elected governor in the fall of 1863. Uh, during his term, uh, Clark tried to make the state militia more efficient uh, with only, I would say, limited success. Uh, under the previous governor, under Pettus, uh, the militia system was something of a, of a, of a mess. Uh, by the 18, end of 1862, the militia reported uh, itself as uh, uh, manned by discontented, half-mutinous, and uh, depleted by uh, desertion. And there was a, a good reason for that. Uh, the state just simply uh, didn't have enough money to adequately pay these soldiers. Uh, they were not able to keep their families fed while they were serving in the militia. And uh, there was just a lot of discontent uh, in, in, uh, amongst the militiamen. And a lot of them uh, either deserted or went AWOL for long periods of time so they could go home and help take, uh, take care of their families. Because uh, that, would, in the end, was the, the most important thing to them. Uh, as one uh, militia soldier who wrote, uh, wrote into the governor said, uh, Fight we can't until our families are better cared for. Uh, wives are writing for their husbands, and they are coming to them on account of their suffering condition. And although they weren't really a, an effective fighting force, by the fall of 1864, there were about 8,000 militia soldiers on duty in Mississippi. And morale was initially high when the war started, but as uh, the fighting uh, came inside Mississippi's borders and uh, civilians were made to feel the hard hand of war, um, you're going to see morale start to uh, dramatically decline. Uh, in, the, in, Cor uh, in Corinth, you had a, a major battle. Uh, uh, the city fell to Union forces in May 1862, uh, followed by a bloody repulse by the Confederates under General Earl Van Dorn to retake the town in October 1862. Uh, this was just going to pave the way for further federal incursions into the northern part of the state. Uh, after the Battle of Iuka, Mississippi, uh, the two Confederate armies in, in the state uh, combined under the leadership of Senior uh, General Earl Van Dorn uh, for an attack on Corinth. Uh, this new rebel force was known as the Army of West Tennessee. And in the Battle of Corinth on October 3rd and 4th, 1862, the Confederates were very bloodily repulsed and uh, Van Dorn was forced to retreat. In fact, uh, this is a picture of some of the Confederate dead around Battery Robinette at Corinth. Uh, in fact, Corinth is the only battlefield in the state where there are actual photographs of a Confederate dead. Uh, it's kind of a, a unique uh, battle in that sense. Uh, Mississippi uh, fought... Uh, very well at uh, Corinth, and uh, there were a number of Mississippi regiments engaged in the battle. Um, the soldiers from the Magnolia State suffered very heavily in the Battle of Corinth. It's hard to, to know any complete numbers, but uh, uh, there, were, there were at least 91 killed and about 400 wounded in the various Mississippi regiments that fought at Corinth. And then after the fall of Corinth, uh, there increasingly large part of the of the state was overrun by invading Union armies. A few towns were garrisoned by federal troops until the end of the conflict. Uh, more were in the occasional possession of the uh, of the enemy. In the northern and western counties of the, the state, there existed almost two years where uh, there were large portions of land that were just basically a no man's land subject to constant raiding and pillaging by both sides. And uh, a lot of Mississippi civilians learned what it was like to, uh, to live in, uh, in occupied, occupied territory or in contested territory. And uh, it was a very hard life indeed. Um, some uh, cities uh, were almost destroyed. Uh, Grand Gulf, Friars Point, and Prentice uh, were burned. Uh, Jackson, Oxford, and Holly Springs all suffered extremely heavy damage. Uh, Columbus and Macon were probably the two largest towns in the state uh, to escape any serious damage from the enemy. And I would say no event had more of an impact on the morale of Mississippians than the surrender of Vicksburg on July 4th, 1863. With the surrender of Vicksburg and then a few days later at Port Hudson, Louisiana, federal forces had complete control of the Mississippi River. And everyone recognized this was a major uh, setback for the uh, goal of Confederate independence. 
Former Mississippi Congressman Wiley P. Harris wrote of the fall of Vicksburg, quote, when the federal forces, naval and land forces took possession of the Mississippi River from its mouth to its source, it became apparent to me that we could never have the strength to recover it and that it would never be surrendered to us in any settlement and without it, independence was simply impossible. I express this opinion to influential persons being no longer connected with public affairs. I was not one of those who thought our failure was due to any blunders, military or civil. Upon the whole, I thought we had made the most of our resources. The conviction came over me that we had made a sad mistake. And I'd like to read you a little portion of a letter written by an unidentified lady in Port Gibson. Uh, this letter was published in the Daily Constitutionalist of Augusta, Georgia on August 13, 1864, and it provides a rather intimate glimpse of uh, uh, what war was like when civilians became targets of, a, of an occupying army. And this is the, the letter dated July 21, 1864. Your last letter was received 20 days after it was written. I was glad you had heard from your prisoner brothers. We can hear nothing. All communication is stopped. The gunboat at Grand Gulf has over 100, uh, 100 letters and will not let us have them, nor will they send any to us. I fear the boys are suffering. You must write them often. You speak of the 4th of July. On that day, a severe battle was fought out here at Mr. Coleman's, and at that time we could hear all day the booming of cannon around Clinton and the Big Black. The 4th of July is the Yankee Carnival of Blood. On the 7th, we had to fight here in town. Several Yankees were killed. On the 14th instant, however, we were completely surprised. The enemy came in on three roads from Jackson. Cavalry and infantry, two large brigades being Negroes. I can hardly write. I am heartsick. We suffered nothing when Grant's army went through in comparison to what we have this time. They camped here just at Parker's, General Ellett's headquarters at Parker's, and General Slocum's in town. All the first day they were in the yard, killing and cooking my chickens and everything else they could seize, fruits, corn, and so on. Winfield got so frightened and ran up to the woods. I have no one with me but Mrs. Merrifield's two little boys, and they sat and cried most of the time. I asked 20 officers for a guard, but could not get one till night. I sat up the whole night in great anxiety, fearful for, fearful for Winfield, as the child had foolishly run off with your gun, and the Negroes told me they had taken him, but he escaped. At daylight, the guard left, and we soon heard the drum of the infantry coming down the road, and all Negroes at that. I begged of the guard to stay. He promised to return, but as great a villain as the rest, he only returned when the Negroes came to rob and plunder. They stacked arms in our lane, and then took the chickens and other fowls, then broke open the smokehouse, took every mouthful of meat, all the lard they could, turning the rest on the floor, pouring the vinegar over that, and then threw a box of lime over it all took the soap and the salt and all the tools, broke open the cottage, cut the cloth out of the loom, broke everything belonging to it, all the spinning wheels, all the milk crocks, all the jars, everything in the cottage, then for the house. They have left. Uh, our men are watching their movements, no telling how soon they will be back. The Lord grant never, but I am thankful it is no worse. Here is war, war, the horrors of war. And uh, that's a, a pretty accurate uh, description of what uh, sometimes happened when uh, the Union Army went foraging uh, amongst the civilians. A lot of uh, Union soldiers had come to the conclusion that they needed to make the war as hard as possible on Confederate civilians uh, uh, to put pressure on the uh, on uh, the, the government to the Confederate government to, uh, to give up the fight, and uh, and they did, and uh, it was going to make make uh, simple survival very difficult for uh, families in the state. The fall of Vicksburg in uh, July 1863 allowed the Federals to march on and besiege Mississippi's capital city of Jackson in July 1863. Uh, the Union Army never attempted to hold the city, but they staged a number of raids on Jackson, uh, burning and destroying each time they took the city. Union soldier Joseph Yag or Job Yaki, a member of the 124th Illinois Infantry, wrote, 
The, the Jackson of February 1864 was not the Jackson of May 1863. Then it was a beautiful city. Now it is a heap of ruins. Some of the citizens called it Chimneyville from the great number of standing chimneys from which the buildings have been burned. And uh, the fighting in around Vicksburg had displaced many civilians who had gone to Jackson. Uh, one uh, young refugee, Ida Withers, was forced to flee with her family in, in 1863. And uh, they were still in the city when it was attacked by the, the, the Union forces commanded by General William T. Sherman. Uh, Withers later recalled how her family lived in a railroad freight car and said that, quote, it was near the pontoon bridge over the Pearl River and was to be sent further up the road if the battle went against our troops, as it was sure to do. It was at sufficient distance from the fight to be out of range of the guns, but all that day we heard the rattle of musketry and the breaking of shells, but no longer like distant thunder as the Vicksburg guns had sounded. The people of Mississippi, in particular the women, did a remarkable job in manufacturing and making do with substitute materials of every kind that they were unable to obtain during the war. Uh, much of this work uh, was done uh, uh, by, you know, wives and daughters. Uh, the, most of the men folk were gone except for the very young and the very old. But uh, the ladies of Mississippi handled the family finances. They farmed. They made clothes for children and soldiers. They managed slaves. They did the hundreds of other tasks necessary to run a farm or a business. They really stepped up and filled that void that had to be filled when the men folk uh, went off to war. Uh, in 1903, W.P. Chapman of Brandon wrote a series of reminiscences about uh, his childhood during the Civil War. And in a series of 13 articles for the Brandon News, uh, starting on April 2, 1903, he described what life was like on a farm in Rankin County during the war. And he said, But to my mind, there is another side to this most interesting question which has not been treated with the courtesy and respect it deserves. It is the home side of life in the war times, or the hardship and sufferings of the home people during the fearful scourge of civil war. And he talked about just, I mean, how they survived. And he, he said uh, of the food they ate, Quote, we used the potato in a variety of ways for the table and stock. Potato bread and beer was a favorite way of using them. Then we baked and fried and stewed them. We also cultivated peas, rice, pumpkins, goobers, watermelons, and all kinds of garden vegetables. We made pumpkin bread by mixing boiled pumpkins with cornmeal and baking it. And while it was not as sweet as it might be, it had a beautiful bright color. We used for coffee okra. We parched goober, goobers and meal brand, and in the spring of the year, sassafras tea. Heavenly dust or flour was a thing of the past, but we planted different kinds of small grain. Uh, Chapman went on to say about the clothing that they wore, uh, Our women wore uh, shoes made from light leather taken from our home tan yards, or from goat, coon, or possum hides. The men and boys wore homespun cloth for pantaloons, shirts, and all kinds of underwear. A boy to have pants and a shirt properly checked with agreeable contrast in warp and filling and a shirt made up in soldier style with pockets in front was considered fixed up for business. We plated all kinds of straw and palmetto and hats were made for every day and for Sunday wear and when finished with old calico lining and a red band we felt like a Rothschild or a Vanderbilt among the less favored class of the vicinity. The war was also very difficult for the African Americans in bondage in the state. At the beginning of the war, uh, probably the majority of Northerners had no interest in destroying slavery. Uh, as President Abraham Lincoln said, uh, the war was, it said at its beginning, the war was being fought to preserve the Union. But as the war dragged on uh, into 1862, uh, a new purpose uh, was going to arise uh, for the war, and that was the crusade to, to end slavery. Uh, many Northerners saw that freeing slaves uh, weakened the Confederate war effort, and after the Union victory at the Battle of Antietam, Maryland on September 17, 1862, the President issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which went into effect on January 1, 1863, freeing slaves in areas of, of the state still in insurrection. And it's true that this procl proclamation, uh, which was later made law by the 13th Amendment, 
uh, did not apply to large uh, swaths of Mississippi where Confederate forces were still in control. But slaves all over the state knew of the proclamation and thousands of them uh, fled to Union lines for their freedom. By the time the war ended in 1865, there were 20,000 former slaves living in Vicksburg alone. Uh, there were also large numbers of them in Natchez as well, which was un also under uh, Union control. And at the time of the war, approximately 55% or uh, 435,268 uh, persons uh, uh, of African American descent uh, were listed as slaves in the 1860 census. Uh, the total population of the state was only 791,396. So uh, the slave, uh, slaves were majority of the population in the state. And in, in, a, in a situation like this where slaves uh, were the majority of the population, uh, the fears of a slave insurrection are, were always present among the white population. Uh, to reduce the chances of a slave revolt, the legislature uh, passed laws imposing severe penalties for tampering with slaves, requiring owners uh, of their slaves to quarter them within at least a, a mile of the residence of the owner or overseer, and prohibiting masters from allowing their slaves to go at large and trade as free men. And uh, fear of what might happen to their families uh, left in communities that were uh, largely devoid of white uh, men uh, caused many uh, would-be soldiers to carefully consider before enlisting in the army. But uh, by the spring of 1862, they weren't going to have a choice. Uh, the first military draft in American history was enacted by the Confederate government on April 16, 1862, uh, more than a year before the, the federal government took the same step. And the Confederacy had to do this. Uh, they were outnumbered and they were, their territory was being assailed on every front by uh, overwhelming numbers of Union forces. And uh, the compulsory service law was very unpopular in the South. Uh, it was viewed as a, a, a usurpation of the rights of individuals by the Confederate government, and it, it was one of the reasons the South had gone to war in the first place. But uh, under the Conscription Act, all healthy white men between the ages of 18 and 35 were liable for three-year term of service. Uh, the Act also extended the terms of enlistment for all one-year soldiers to three years. A September 1862 amendment raised the age limit to 45, and in February 1864, the limits were extended uh, to range between 17 and 50, or as, as many people uh, uh, like to say, uh, the Confederacy was robbing the cradle and the grave to keep its, uh, keep its armies uh, uh, manned. Uh, exempted from the draft were men employed in certain occupations considered to be critical to the war effort, uh, civil officials, telegraph operators, miners, druggists, and teachers. And, uh, and in a very controversial move, uh, on October 11th, the Confederate Congress amended the draft law to exempt anyone who owned 20 or more slaves. Uh, further, until the practice was abolished in December 1863, a rich drafted man could hire a substitute to take his place in the ranks, uh, an unfair practice which brought on charges of class discrimination. So the a lot of Mississippians got very upset set by the uh, the law that allowed uh, owners of uh, tw twenty or more slaves to get out of serving, and also by the subscription or act which allowed people to buy their way out of the army. Uh, those two. Uh, uh, measures were extremely unpopular amongst the, the, the middle and lower classes of white people in the state. In many neighborhoods, the older men, uh, not liable for the draft, banded together and served as home guards uh, or with local vigilance committees. And uh, their basic job was to, to, to make sure that the slaves in the area were kept under a tight rein. Uh, where slaves did remain on their plantations and did not seek to run uh, uh, to Union lines, there were a lot of cases of insubordination and even violence. But uh, uh, summary justice against uh, the, the worst of the offenders uh, really discouraged this kind of uh, this kind of behavior. On December 23, 1862, William Henry Calhoun, a wealthy planter from Pontotoc County, wrote to Governor John J. Pettus. And he explained how the Con Conscription Act was affecting his part of the state. And he said, 
Governor Pettis, I write to inform you of the condition of our county and ask uh, for a possible remedy. We have to complain uh, that since and before the federal raid into our county, many of uh, the planters have left home, taking in many instances none of their Negroes off with them. Ours is just now a most dangerous condition. Hundreds of Negro men have been left in our midst, either alone or with a nominal master, allowed to do as they please, no restraint put upon them. This state of things will surely result in an insurrection or some other great calamity. Can you not order that, that where they are thus left, that the men be taken charge of by the army and put to state or confederate service? If you are not in the proper person to direct this matter, will you do us the great favor to address the proper authority and have the matter attended to? Uh, act promptly for humanity's sake and oblige your friend W. Henry Calhoun and many other citizens. And while the state did use slaves on, uh, uh, in large numbers to work on uh, Confederate fortifications, to help build railroads and repair railroads, to help uh, 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 as Teamsters in the Confederate Army, um, they simply did, the state government did not have the manpower to check all of these slaves that were suddenly left with little or no supervision. And so uh, for civilians in the, uh, in the rural areas, um, there was no help forthcoming from the, uh, the federal government. And this brings to an end my, uh, my little talk on the home front. Uh, I hope you found it uh, of interest. If you liked it, uh, please give it a, a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do. I've got one more talk in this series that will be on uh, the end of the war and what conditions were like in Mississippi immediately after the war ended. Uh, that'll be coming up very shortly, so stay tuned for it. But I uh, hope you enjoyed this uh, little talk, and uh, thank you very much.